This is the clicker. Thanks. Is this working? How is everybody? <laughs> Thank you, uh, David, and everyone for having me here today. Um, it's a real exciting time. I just moved from Denver, so it's weird to be back in Denver. <laughs> also, it's it's kind of odd because in the in almost 20 years I lived here, I never went to tracks. And as a gay guy, you would think that would have been accomplished, but I had to move away to come back. So uh, I can now say I've been to tracks. <laughs> Um, uh, I just thought we'd start by taking a moment to be still, maybe like maybe a whole five seconds. You know, there's been some uh, experiments done with, with folks over the years, a very highly publicized one, where people would rather be shocked, literally with electricity, than sit still for 15 minutes. Um, our minds are so atrophied. Uh, from having our attention pulled constantly in every direction that people would rather be shocked nowadays than just sit still. And I think it's important to remember when you're dealing with topics as large as vast amounts of information that just sitting still is still a viable option. There's a lot of information in just sitting still, information about you. And that information is kind of what we're going to delve into today. Um, the presentation itself um, if I can figure out how this clicker works, is going to be a little bit about my journey and then a little bit about where I think this is going in the near future. Uh, obviously, there'll be some privacy overtones. Everyone likes to talk about privacy. And let me just say, I've gotten a chance to share the stage with Amber Case twice, once at MIT at Cyborg Camp recently, and then again today, and it is never not nerve-wracking following Amber Case. Um, but my story, the story that you see up on the screens, actually started because of Amber Case. I was at Cyborg Camp in 2012 in Portland as a uh, kind of defunct IT guy, and I showed Amber something I was working on, and she said, you've got to show everybody this. And I said, I don't want to show people this. It's, it's, it's goofy. And she was, just show it. It's so cool. And I hated her. I was so mad because I was so nervous. And then I showed a bunch of people who came to this room what I was doing, and they all kind of thought, oh, that's really exciting. And then our, our writer from Wired was there, and the first piece came out on me. So I have Amber to thank for all the attention, which sometimes makes my heart rate close to 150 and hard to keep you know, a coherent sentence together. So thank you, Amber, for those days. Um, but a lot of good things has happened from that, too. Before we get uh, too far into this, if you can read that, that's everything you'd want to know about me. Right? So how much money do I make? How much is my house worth? You know, uh, what am I going to die from? Uh, I don't really have this, this, this belief in privacy like a lot of people do. Uh, I think it's a construct that once you have enough money, you want to believe that privacy exists. But I've been poor and homeless. When you're poor and homeless, you don't have privacy. Privacy is something you have when you think you've gotten to a point in your life where no one can touch you. It's a social construct, and it's bullshit. And if you get rich enough, you don't care about it. And if you're poor enough, you don't care about it. But the rest of us in the middle, we're trapped, worrying, and consumed about it. So I just want to tell you, I don't care about it. Um, you know, post-privacy as a, as a topic is something that's really difficult for people to get their heads around. Um, for me, it really started with the journey that I took. And there were three main areas that I focused on when I created this journey. The one was everything I was doing was trapped in some type of device whether it was on my laptop or my phone or in a device in my home. The second thing was I wasn't really living my life out, out in public. I was kind of consumed by everything I was inside of. And the third thing was I was really starting to suffer. I'd been in an IT for most of the 90s and it almost killed me because I was always on some type of device. I didn't need a mobile phone to be addicted to tech. So I looked a little bit back at the way that humans kind of related to each other and to themselves for kind of a consistent theme around contemplation and behavior change. And if you go back 30,000 years, most of what we collected, we wrote onto cave walls. And that stuff still exists to today. So if you really want to live in the future, just drop all the tech and go write on something hard. It'll probably be around in 20 years. Whereas the rest of what you're doing is evaporating as fast as you're creating it. 
we move out to 3,000 years, 2,000 years, we get into Pyrrhus, the stones, and the ability to have language democratize things. Books came along to democratize language. More people could get access to information from books. If we go out a little bit further, about 600 years ago, we'll see the first movable type printing presses. Oddly enough, we went from 10 million books to 100 million books between the 16th and 17th century. And with that much information overload, you'd think it would have crushed us, but instead it created what we now refer to as the Renaissance. So more information doesn't kill a culture. It actually encourages it to be creative. A uh, speaker that I saw earlier today was talking about abundance. And that's kind of sort of the world we're looking in, although I would not consider myself Kurzweilian. Actually, Ray Kurzweil thinks I'm nuts, which is a really nice thing. Because uh, if Ray Kurzweil thinks you're a little this way of normal, then you're probably doing something right. Um, and then if you go back just about 200 years ago, we had newspapers, um, which is basically just a book that's printed every day. Um, and this picture does shows people using their newspapers, but they're not, they're not like talking to each other. So mobile devices aren't making us antisocial. Information makes us antisocial. And how you use information actually makes you antisocial. Then we move out to mass media about 100 years ago. We move on from there. Um, out to the, the things that we know today, which is the digitization of things. Uh, let me get back one. So if you could find a floppy drive somewhere in Denver right now, it, you'd be hard pressed. But how much information do we have in systems that we no longer can have access to? How many things are we creating in files that will be irrelevant or we can't figure out how to use in 20 years? And then even if we remove the digitization and we just look at the connectivity to each other about 10 years ago with social networks, you as an organic node actually start dissolving the minute you move into someone else and into another system. Amber talked about you know, this, this idea of self, but really you're a, you're a collection of fluid selves that's changing every moment. And what system you engage with is actually shaping the fluidity of the self that you're sharing at that moment. But it gets a little bit darker, I'm afraid, before we start to see some of the, some of the light. I was one of those people was a holdout. I had my, my CDs. I would not go to digital music. Then I went to digital music, and I would not do buy uh, uh, streaming music. And now all I do is stream music. So I just borrow someone else's mood. I just look at someone else's playlist, and I let them influence me. I don't have my own moods. I have the other people's that I borrow in connected systems. And I'm sure you all borrow moods every day when you think about the systems that you use. Also, 2014 was the event horizon for more digital books than printed books. The information that in the companies that are created today, the more ephemeral the information, the more it's worth. Waze is a great traffic app. Google bought them for a billion dollars, but how long is a traffic accident good for? Maybe 30 minutes? So if you really want to change the future, create a company that creates information that's so valuable but disappears so rapidly because we value what we can't save now that we can save everything. And more importantly, language itself is dissolving. If you look at the move from memes to emoji to even the way that Apple is going to change our industry with how we communicate with each other, we really don't have text-based characters, or as Amber talks about, even soft buttons to move into. We're starting to look at what it would be like to move into environmental buttons or emotional buttons. And a lot of my friends, they'll record their entire day and then they'll, or their entire vacation, then they'll share it, but they'll share it right along with their physical activity. And Facebook's gracious enough to let you give them a year's worth of data and they give you back 30 seconds at the end of the year as part of their look back project. You get a whole 30 seconds back for a year's worth of data input. You're basically like Fred Flintstone for social media. You know, you're just doing work that no one appreciates and going home to a wife that doesn't want to chat with you. So what do we do about all of this? And ah, Sorry, Amber. Sorry. <laughs> but what do we do with all this information in this, this kind of dissolving world? Uh, I think it's important to remember um, that it's not just me that's noticing this. This is what Apple has for their 2015 New Year, New Year, New You, New Year campaign. Notice to be a new you, they don't say get healthy is number one. Notice they don't say get active is number one. Actually, get eat right and get healthy are number two and number three. The first thing Apple wants you to do to get better in 2015 is remember each day. Why is that? Because we don't. We don't remember anything anymore. It's okay. I might be the first person who told you, but you won't remember in five minutes. <laughs> so it's interesting that Apple is telling us and queuing us up for a world where your information is so ephemeral it can be sold back to you. 
your behavior is being sold back to you. We just don't know how to think about it in that way just yet. See, it's my opinion that what we entered into around 2008 when I started collecting my life was this period of time like the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark where we had this most powerful technology in the world and we we're about to create it up and wheel it into a warehouse where maybe a Tomb Raider would need it in the future. But it's you and you're being put away. So in 2008, I decided to do something really simple. I said, hey, I'm never going to go offline. Everything I touch, I'm going to scrape for information and then use that information to make my life better. Pretty ambitious goal. I didn't think anybody would ever care, but it was important to me at the time. I did this in five steps. That's not me, although it, he is in much better shape than I was. So the five steps are pretty straightforward. Um, I'm having some problems with the clicker. The first one was examining how am I. So understanding my medical health. My doctor who I had here in Denver, Dr. Will Alford, brilliant man, he should retire. He's just, he works so hard, but he does not want to stop. He's close to 84 years old now. Had him for close to 20 years. He had four inches of, of records on me, and he never looked at any of them when I went to see him. Do you ever go see your doctor and think, why do you even keep records? You don't look at them, All right? So I started taking, you'll see from my Palm Pilot that I was using in 2006, I started taking to the doctor and writing down everything he said. Because if he wasn't going to look at my, at my notes, I would. I then went in and asked for all my medical charts. And I had them all digitized in 2010 and had all my lab results put into spreadsheets. Because you know, if you're going to do a pivot chart, you know, maybe you should know a little bit about your own life and your blood. And it's that time of year. And, you know. Um, I then, from there, started getting involved in big data trends. So Google had this great thing in 2011 called Flu Near You. So I would take my pivot charts of my, <laughs> my charts, my, my text analysis of my own visits, and, and this, this big data from Google, and I'd march into Dr. Alford's office and say, give me a medicine now. And he'd say, just get out of here. You know, just, he just, your doctor doesn't want to deal with you. I got involved in patient communities. So when I got a, prescribed a drug or a diagnosis, I'd find out everyone else who had it. You know, it's basically like using WebMD, but like much more weaponized. Um, you, you know, we all weaponize WebMD. Come on. Uh, how many of you read like the side effects of the prescription before you open the bottle? I mean, it's just you develop them before the bottle is even out of the bag. You know, this is what information does. It over-informs a mind that can't stay focused. A mind that can stay focused can handle a lot of information. A mind that can't stay focused will f spill over like lava. I then got into wearable technology and even some wearable technology platforms, dove head, head on into 23andMe and, and microbiome, so you biome. I studied everything there was about me from top to bottom. The second thing I had to do was figure out, well, who am I? Like, I'm in all these digital systems from the things on my phone to my credit cards to the, to the electric bill, but yet I have none of this information that's available to me. And these are just some screen captures of the things I was inside of that I couldn't get access to. It's my information. Why is it only once a year Chase sends me a summary that tells me how I spent my money at tax season? It would help me all year long to know that. But we don't think about how these things work together, and I think it's one of those things we're going to have to start getting into. And then finally, how would you organize a life? Right? If you had access to all this information like I was doing, how would you organize it? For me, there were three main tenets. There were soft data, hard data, and core data. Soft data was anything I did that was constructed and helped form an identity that someone believed to be true. They were the Instagram photos in fabulous places I didn't have enough money to spend to go to. Right? They were the elaborate email signatures that basically said I'm really important. Do you ever notice the longer the email signature, the bigger the dick? It just there's something about the length of your email signature that just shows what an ass you are, right? Or, or what, a, what a horrible company you work at, because they have these gigantic, and then they put these gigantic legal disclaimers. It's like, it's like junk mail that gets, fills your box, and you go through it anyway, because there might be a letter inside. It right? might be something in that email signature. Second thing was hard data. So hard data was really the information I couldn't fake, the inf stuff I couldn't pretend to be. That was the sensors on your arm, the brightness of this light, the sound of my voice going from 70 to 75 to 80 to 85 decibels, right? That data is harder to fake, but it's the real. And then there's core data. It's the blood. It's the genetics. It's the information that comes from inside you that was given to you. And we know from science that both neuroplasticity and epigenetics tells us that your genes aren't set in stone and neither are your behaviors. You can rewire both. 
but you need behavior change. And behavior change under comes from understanding what a fluid self is versus a constructed self or a dynamic self. So once I had this information and I could organize it in a way that I could actually weight the information, soft data is not as important as hard data, core data is actually contextually related to environmental information as it relates to soft data at the time, it's really an elaborate formula but it works. I thought, now what do I do with this? So I looked at my, my information and said the fourth thing I would do was find out what's important. And luckily for me, being at Cyborg Camp, I learned this concept of low friction data collection, which was something that was really important to me. I just didn't have a word for it. And that meant I wanted to collect information, but I wanted to be able to talk to people. <laughs> so like, if you go back thousands of years, the royalty would actually walk around with someone who would record everything they did, right? And they'd say, oh, don't write that part down, right? But I couldn't afford to hire someone to watch me, so I had to find ways that if I touched a Google document, that the touching of that Google document got saved somewhere. You accessed a Google document, and you were here when you did it, and you'd just eaten this, and you were about to do this, and the weather looked like this, and you're listening to this music. Are you with me? Because you all can do this. The crime that's going on right now is that we're not thinking about how important our own lives are. We're more worried about other people. And that's not about being narcissistic. That's about being showing yourself some inward kindness. Second thing was I moved my life into 10 categories. Why 10? I don't know. Maybe I drank too much the night before. But the 10 I picked were health, environment, uh, uh, social media, knowledge work, what I did to get paid, travel, content creation, money, and spirituality. I then overlaid that to Maslow's hierarchy of needs so I knew that certain colors were more important than other colors. I should have a roof over my head before I worry about maybe painting. And then I found a way to move this information out of the internet and into a data repository. For me, that data repository was a calendar. Because the calendar is one of the few systems that both goes backward in time, but more importantly, forward in time. Because we don't spend enough time now, so we might as well spend it either in the future or the past where our minds love to wander. But the problem with scheduling and being able to see your behavior, while I could Google my behavior like crazy, Right? I could say I could show you an entire day instantly and know where I was and who I was and what I did, and it, and it could sponsor absolute behavior change. You cannot actually schedule behavior change. So I had to look at the different ways to start to work around my mind working around a system that I'd created. There were five main lessons I, I took from this. The first was the value of this information, which I think I've done a really good job of driving home. I could have $10,000 worth of gadgets all on my body right now. I could have my house outfitted with $20,000 worth of devices. But out of that $30,000, only 5,000 of it was for the devices. The other 15 was to buy and manage the information back. You see, buying devices is cheap. Your life is so expensive to buy back. These gadgets that we're getting and subsidized are nothing in comparison to the value that we're giving away. The second thing was really the value of identity. Because I knew from being on the internet way too much in the 90s that my identity was being tied to all sorts of things. Right now, we're living in a time where everyone's being measured to death. And your tombstone used to be this, like, the date you were born, the date you died, and this dash. And this dash represented this great life. And now, the dash is full of all these stats and figures to prove that you existed. Right? You've become an anthropologist for your own behavior because you're not sure that it's actually real sometimes. And if you've ever stood in front of a grocery clerk who's trying to check you out and they start to apologize for the speed of the machine, I'm sorry, the machine's going, I know it's okay. It's usually not, it's okay. No, it's really going slow, it's okay. Do you ever notice you have to walk people off a ledge when there, there's a piece of technology between you and them? There's this uncomfortableness that you have to talk and look at each other. We didn't used to behave that way. We'd stand to a register and talk about things. But now technology shapes the experience. I would rather use a self-checkout machine because it feels good to know that it's consistently average. The cashier, the organic body standing there, is inconsistently remarkable. They could be having a good day or they could be having a bad day. A machine always has the same day. And it's sad. Because we become the systems we don't use, right? If you've ever contorted yourself to get a picture and almost put your life in danger, or, or held your phone up like Lion King, right? We're, we're treating our technology in ways that we don't even have the kindness to show to each other, much less ourselves. 
And if you've ever talked to someone and they started answering a question you haven't finished asking, before it, you could give me two words out, you're talking to autocomplete. Everybody's turned into Google autocomplete. They give you the answers without three words out of your mouth. Why? It can wait. And I think it's an important commentary about what we're doing with information and what information is doing with us. There's no answer that needs to be autocompleted between two people other than I love you. The rest of it can wait. I love this tweet. The card reader, the gas pumps broke, so now I've got to go inside and pay like a poor person. Right? So this person has tied their identity to their wallet, to dealing with another human, to a piece of tech. Right? I don't think you could have sewed together more crazy in one tweet than if you, if you tried to. And, and what does it mean when you tie your wallet to using a tech system to having to talk to a, to a person? Oh my God, I have to talk to a person. Right? So to me, it's not about data. We can talk about data all day long. It's about identity. Because if you want to understand people in the future, you have to build for a fluid identity. And fluid identity is built on more things than just location. It's built on behavior. And behavior is really easy to understand. You see, at the end of the day, we become the systems we use. We become what we bend into. Ask any contortionist. Except right now, we're folding into little data streams and packets of information for other people to consume and use as their means of living. And then perspective. Perspective is a hell of a drug. Uh, I've tried a lot of drugs, none of them here at Trax, but perspective is probably my favorite. Um, you see, I had some problems sleeping, and I, I went to Dr. Alfred and demanded this information. He goes, keep measuring. It's not you. There's something else. And sure enough, I found, by just putting a $100 sensor in my room, it was the light. It was the, it was the sound in the middle of the night. It was the temperature fluctuations. It was crazy. And getting in my car, I would aggressively drive. The CO2 levels in the house were off. Just by correlating a little information, I found out there was really nothing wrong with my sleep. The room was bad, and there was nothing wrong with my driving. It was the environment I was leaving. I took that information, and then I, I changed it around a little bit, and I fixed my sleep. You see, you're not broken. The world you're living in is. And measuring yourself to death won't fix it. Look out. Finally, behavior itself is really important to evaluate. As I've said so many times, what we've done now with consumer techs and what the big companies are doing are turning our behavior into the new user interface. So a Luna mattress that changes your temperature automatically based on your sleeping is using you as a mouse pad. Your car that automatically tells your house that you're close is using you as a trackpad. The job on up that's saying, hey, adjust the house for this is using you as an interface. Your behavior is the interface, not you, your behavior. We call this convenience. You sometimes call it privacy. But as Amber said, you will trade away your privacy for convenience every time. And we need to look at how that works. It's no mistake that they released Apple Pay with HealthKit. Not two separate releases, one. Why you need to know what my heart rate is when I'm buying a Mc, Mc, Mc quarter pounder, I don't know. But you just wrapped that in one convenient push update. And it atropies us. This is an ad from Microsoft. I think it's a really scary ad. This device knows me better than I know myself. I can help me be a better human. Well, we already know what devices do about making people better humans. And being a better one isn't one of them. So how we treat the quantify itself and how we use these devices and how we examine our behavior is really important because your life is now officially a platform. And if your life's a platform and how you live your life is going to become very important. Feedback, though, is probably the, the best out of all of this. Because I took all of this information, and I, I constructed a world where my information was fed back to me at, at appropriate times. If I was in the middle of the fourth, season, or the fourth episode of uh, Breaking Bad, I would get a push alert saying, you probably need to get off the couch. Right? I had all sorts of financial routines. I couldn't buy things that were a certain distance from my house. I'd have to walk to them if I wanted them. So I actually used the data to lose about 140 pounds. And this information wasn't some Jenny Craig diet. It was my own information just sent to me at appropriate times. I mean, if I'm going to be somebody else's mouse pad, maybe I should benefit from having being touched. So this is really the, the body of work that we're looking at creating here in the future. And I think it's so important because we all want to be resilient. And resilient is literally the act of perpetually living in perspective. When you can per perpetually see and value your life, 
as much as advertisers and businesses do, you will grow exponentially because you are worth it. So some solutions and implications of what, what we're going through. You all know there are billions, maybe trillions of dollars on the ground. And Facebook in 2014 for $150 billion bought an app called Moves. Moves does two things really well. It collects information and just keeps it. Doesn't, doesn't make you check in. You don't have to log into it, right? I think we should be building apps and services that you, you create, you sign into once, and then you walk away to from six months, and six months from now you go back and go, look at all this information about me. It's amazing. I feel better about myself. Things you have to go to and talk to all the time, no one wants to do that. We should talk to each other. Capital One bought, acquired Level last month for like $150 million. Level One just told you what your bank balances were and how fast you were spending money. We used to call that your spouse. <laughs> but it was a $150 billion low friction ambient feedback company. TripAdvisor was purchased um, for a company called Rove for $200 million. Rove basically shows you what you're listening to and the pictures you're taking, right? That's worth 200 million, I guess so. And then of course Under Armour for half a billion dollars just got my fitness pal. And my fitness pal is basically a pterodactyl carrying a rock when it comes to interfaces. Because it, it's, it pains you, but you log your food in it and you know how many calories you have left in the day. We used to use points, but we now can't think or remember anything, so we have to have an app do it for us. So moving forward, some solutions we want to focus on. Think about when you're constructing ideas or solutions, not this concept of big brother or Orwellian future, but this concept of big mother. What would it look like if the information was kind that you collected and you explained up front why you were taking it and how you were going to help someone with it? Design for contemplation, not attention. Right now, we have a race to the bottom of the brain stem. Everything we do is for the immediate gratification of attention. Attention lives in the limbic system, which is the lowest possible common denominator. You might as well kill something with your bare hands than use your attention. If you build for perspective, you climb up the brainstem at least to closer to the neocortex. Put the internet in your products, not your products onto the internet. When you put the internet in products, it makes sense. Right? They can actually see and talk to other things. But just putting something on the internet for the sake of being connected doesn't help anyone. Amber talks a lot about let humans do what humans do well and let tech do what tech does well. Create low tech uh, and, and human gathering systems. So places where people can gather around, places where people already gather around. Repeatable substandard solutions be inconsistent or remarkable ones. Don't try to hit it out of the park on your first run. Build something that's repeatedly substandard and people will use it. We want consistency because we can't stand our attention to veer from the moment that's fleeting that we shouldn't be paying attention to anyway. Insert yourself into perpetual present. Douglas Rushkoff calls this present shock, but we all are melting and living in this moment that's going and going and going. It's why we feel so busy. It's why inbox zero came. It's because we can't keep up. Recognize the fluid self, all the versions of you. Do you ever notice when you go to some websites, there's six different social logins to log into a site? And you pick the one that's closest to the needs of the site unconsciously. Sometimes you'll use LinkedIn, sometimes you use Google, sometimes you use Facebook, sometimes you'll use your email. But you understand the cost and what they're getting. Social login's brilliant, but imagine if you could log in with behavior. You could get rid of passwords. Wouldn't the site be more tailored to what you wanted? Design for behavior as a platform. So when you're designing, think about what a set of behavior criteria would look like and what your platform would do in response to that. Focus on a world where there aren't keyboards and screens. This is really easy to do. Amber talked about invisible buttons. It's already here. So why would you build for it? And I don't care if that world's full of people talking to each other. It worked fine for centuries. Put kindness back into all your products, services, and applications. You can. There is an idea. There is a methodology coming out of Silicon Valley about ethical design right now. So, you know, in kind of closing, you know, in 2012, it became not a phone that took pictures. It became a camera that made calls. We moved from SMAC, Social Mobile Analytical Cloud, to Seam, which is sensor, <laughs> environment, algorithmic, and mesh. The internet's now all over our bodies, terraforming us like we're in the matrix. The internet's now crawling all over our homes, terraforming us like we're in the matrix. 
In 2015, our bodies become an interface. In 2016, the environment becomes the interface. In 2017, your behavior becomes the interface for all social interactions between you and your financial items and your friends. Existence itself becomes programmable by 2018. Uh, by 2019, habits will be sold to you as often as apps. By 2020, we'll be looking at objects that personify who we want to be at that moment. And by, I think, the, uh, the beginning of the next decade, we'll be looking at shifting identity as easily as we change our shirts because our identities will be so tied to fluid digital things. So design for ethical behavior. Amber likes to talk about calm technology. We live in an era of disruptive technology now. But design for calm technology, stuff that doesn't take people away from the moment. And when you can, design for technology that's based on someone's values, what they want to believe in, what they should believe in. Design for kind technology, technology that shows people the best parts of them. We have enough systems shaming us, telling us what we're not focusing on, telling us who we aren't. Tell someone who they can be and who they are. And finally, design for contemplation. Give people a sense of who they are and what they believe in as a whole, as a species. We can do this together. See, we need to stop, stop solving our human problems with more technology. And we need to start solving our technology problems with our humanity. Thank you.